Greetings, Tavarishi, and welcome to the Eastern Border. Before we start, I would like to apologize for taking so long with this episode. We had to solve some technical problems before making actual content here. On the good side of things, we have gotten a new logo and a banner, for which we say thank you to our listener Danutamitula. Without further delay then, episode 2, The Red Army. There was a popular humoristic radio show in the 70s and the late 60s in the Soviet Union. It was called The Armenian Radio, it was ran from Moscow, but got retransmitted throughout the Soviet Union. It was very good, as the people tell me. It had this segment when you could just call into the show and ask some sort of a question. Well, obviously nobody asked political questions or anything about the military, because, you know, prison, not fun. But it was also a subject of a lot of jokes, where people in those anecdotes would just call the radio and ask some political question. And one of the jokes goes like this. The Armenian radio gets a call. The listener asks, Will there be war when we finally reach communism? And the Armenian radio, after a long deliberation, answers, In principle, no. But there will be such a peace that there won't be two bricks left standing together. That should show you the attitude of the average Soviet citizen towards the military. The military was literally everything. What this also shows, by the way, is that the Soviet Soviet people loved self-deprecation and totally black humor. That, by the way, uh, which would be interesting to you, separates the ex-USSR people from the Americans' mental way. We're pessimists. Complete and utter. Only the worst is always assumed, and you should be prepared for that. There is no hope. These people who think that they can make any difference are fools. You will all lose. That's the general attitude over here. It's not that bad. Hey, I only wanted like three subscribers when I started this. This is a major difference from you listening in the United States, because everything I hear from you is this optimism and this can-do attitude. We can do this. People can win and everything's going to be all right and all of this, which is completely strange to me, for one, because I am used to everything being bad. Whenever we get a new government, it's going to fail. Everything's going to be terrible. Everything is going to be terrible all the time. I will fail at everything that I do and nothing will go right. Ever. And that's the default position. Of course, sometimes something goes right and then I'm very surprised about it. But it's very unlike what I have heard that you have there. You have this optimism, state-level optimism about your military, about your everything, really. About your way of life. That is the American way of life, as I see it. All of this optimism can do, we will make it. All of this emotional greatness, as in, we're the good guys, we're gonna bash everyone. And that was so different here. And that that just brings me to even this military attitude. Because a lot of people in the Soviet Union didn't like their army. I mean, hell, over here in Latvia, not sure about Russia, but over here in Latvia which was in the Soviet Union, we were the Latvian SSR, we cheered against Soviet Union in sports. The miracle on ice, as the Canadians remember it, because hockey is so huge here. We actually argue that we're bigger hockey fans than Canadians. Yeah, we cheered for the Canadians in that game, over here in Latvia, even though we had Latvians playing on the Soviet Union team, because we were a part of the Soviet Union back then. We cheered against our own people because we wanted the Soviet Union to lose. Whenever there were there was soccer played against the Soviet Union. I don't know how it, how it was like in Russia, but we were cheering for anyone who played against the Soviet Union. We didn't like our country. And that extended to the military. That was the whole attitude of all of this. And when I just read about Canadians being these huge fans of hockey and they're so proud about the miracle on ice, that didn't bring any sadness to our country. I remember my dad telling me that he, with his university friends back then, he just went on and was like so happy about it because the Soviet Union cheated blatantly in sports. Which we'll, which we'll get to in another episode when we talk about culture. But this beginning, it was so that you could see the attitude towards the army from the common people. And the Soviet military leaders, yeah, they knew this. By the way, about the pessimism, yeah, and this is why we're here in Latvia. 
when we had to suffer crazy austerity programs which pulled us out of the crisis, uh, n- nobody really cared. Because, hey, at least we have some food and something in the stores. And that is why we really don't really understand the situation in Greece right now. Because our salaries are lower than theirs, and our pensions are lower, and everything's a bit worse. And we had austerity put on us, and we just kind of made it through. So yeah, most people here just think the Greeks are lazy. There is a neat quote from a prominent 19th century Russian satirist, Mikhail Saltikov Shidrin. Whenever someone in Russia starts talking about patriotism, know that something somewhere has been stolen again. This was never so true as in the Soviet times, really. Especially in the Soviet army. Because during the time when the army wasn't preparing to free the crap out of the capitalist world, they were busy stealing things and getting drunk. Now, I can't really tell you precisely about the army of the 40s to 60s, as everyone I know served there starting with the 70s, and a lot of the stuff that I'm about to tell you is highly anecdotal. But know that if anything ex- is exaggerated in these tales, then only a little bit, and in insignificant things. Because for people who live in normal societies, this will sound like complete insanity. But for anyone who has been under the Soviet boot and can speak proper bureaucracy language, this, however, was the daily reality. I mean, sure, the, some of these stories may be fake or exaggerated, but what happened there was totally possible. And if something is exaggerated, then something like that could have happened, and due to the size of the Soviet Union, it must have happened. I'm not claiming 100% accuracy, though, because that would be too much. Even for me, although the people who I've talked with about this, they swear to me that it's all true. Firstly, like I told you before, the army had its own economy. And their own prison system, with their own police, by the way. What they also had was a deep rivalry with the NKVD, Narodny Komisariat Vnutrenich Diel, or People's Commissariat of Internal Affairs. Which by that time, which is the early 70s, had already become the famous KGB. Комитет государственной безопасности, or Committee of National Security. Ah, the spy guys, you might now think, and be completely wrong. KGB wasn't the analogue of CIA. It was the analogue of the FBI. They were answerable to the Ministry of Internal Affairs. And, by the way, had an army of their own, full with marines, tanks, artillery, infantry, and it was meant to guard the borders, shoot counter-revolutionaries and capitalist agents from the citizens of the Soviet Union, mostly. They also guarded Kremlin and were the famous oppressive Cheka. Because their name, KGB, evolved from CKGB, the Extraordinary Commission of National Security. And, you know, they were hated by the army, because these guys were essentially the prison guards of everyone. And they had tanks, planes, all the military equipment on their own. And KGB had their own paid secret agent, who was disguised as a cook, chauffeur, mistress, anything really, next to each of the army's generals and each of the high-positioned people in the army, ready to kill them for treason at any moment. So, there was this rivalry going on there. All the high personnels in the army had their, like, check a guy right next to them, and they knew about this. And their families had these guys, or... And you know that you have all these servants around you, which you get because of your position, and one of them, or more of them, are just ready to kill you. It's not a nice position to be in, so the army didn't really like the so-called police, or militia, which wasn't exactly police, but the secret service to protect the country and enforce communism. Okay, never really got communism, but I hope you get the point. The KGB was also responsible for catching deserters from the army. That one, yeah, same as with everything. Even the amount of deserters that needed to be caught was planned beforehand. In five-year increments. In advance. If you didn't catch enough of deserters, then you can be pretty sure that Gulag has some nice spots for you. Or some other calamity might happen. In Khrushchev's era and the 70s, they had stopped just shooting people openly. Because, you know, Khrushchev publicly cried and denied the Stalin's policies. He told everyone in the 20th Congress of the Communist Party just to grab power, that Stalin was a bad guy, and that he made these atrocities happen, and that everything was terrible, and that there was a personality cult in the Soviet Union. But now it's all gonna change, because we are denying it and being true communists. 
Which, by the way, is interesting because every socialist leader of the Soviet Union and of the Communist Party always tell the people that we are going back to the roots, this is the true communism, whatever came before us, it was terrible. Brezhnev, when Khrushchev was put off after the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Khrushchev was forced to resign, and by the way, Khrushchev was the only Soviet leader who actually was forced to resign by his compatriots. Everyone else died on the job. Everyone. All of the Soviet leaders except Khrushchev died while they were still in office, and Khrushchev was the only one to resign. And they didn't die from assassinations, while well, there are rumors about Stalin, but everyone else basically just were so old that they died from, like, natural causes there. The problem being with the desertion rates, which you had to fulfill, it was actually kind of hard to actually be a deserter. First off, when you were conscripted for the army, they sent you to the farthest possible place available at the time. People from the Baltics, thus, mostly served in Siberia, Far East, and such. And such means Vladivostok, deep south, near near Kazakhstan, really far ends as far from the Baltics as you possibly could get. Or, if you got into the Navy, the Northern Fleet. My stepdad was lucky. He served in the Black Sea Fleet, which at the time was considered to be serving ridiculously close to his home. Black Sea Fleet is based in Sevastopol, which is in Crimea Peninsula, and if you could just open the map and check the distance between Riga and Sevastopol, yeah, that was considered to be extremely close. But, you know, Soviet Union was one-sixth of the world. They had enough space to place you in. You were far away from home, and if the army caught you misbehaving, then, like I mentioned previously, they had a prison of their own. They had this penal battalion system, or Guba for shortness. The army in the Soviet times, there was a joke that the army is just a form of prison. This penal battalion, or Guba, was a prison within a prison. They live in an extreme, like really extreme circumstances, and sometimes even the punishments were like, even though the normal, ordinary punishments were really harsh, and it was really just crazy to be there, because death rate of about 30% in Guba was expected, sometimes they did really extreme things. And this is documented in the archives, by the way. From the documents, the Penal Legion guys were supposed to be the main assault troops, if you misbehave in the army. So, they, the Penal Legion, for example, were the frontal group in the, some massive military exercises in late... <clears throat> they were the frontal group in massive military exercises in late 1953. These exercises were led by the famous General Zhukov. They happened near the Dnieper River, relatively close to the closed military city of Dnieper-Petrovsk. You know, uh, what, what is a closed military city, you ask? Well, that's a city which is totally controlled by the government, and everyone in the area doesn't even know the city exists, and if you go close to it, then some nice military person tells you just to leave. And there were a bunch of these closed military cities. Some were used to mine uranium, make rockets, you know, it's like hidden military industrial complex thing which just normal, ordinary people know nothing about. Well, because such secrecy was only possible in states like the Soviet Union. And everyone who served in these exercises were supposed to sign this paper not telling anyone where they were serving, and there were no official date even available at the time in these exercises. They were so secret that even in the old of all of the official documentation, like if the 19th Division was there in the documents, the 19th Division was somewhere far away in Vladivostok doing something else. And why, why this is important? Because these exercises were to test the troop advance in an assault. After a tactical nuclear strike. That area, in modern day eastern Ukraine, was chosen because the terrain and the weather there mostly resembled the one found in western Germany and in France. In case you were wondering against what would the Soviets fight using their land forces. Zhukov dropped a nuke on constructed defensive positions filled with live cows, pigs, and other animals to test the effect on live tissue, about 20 kilometers away from the infantry force. Then, 15 minutes after the impact, three panel divisions, mechanized though, were ordered to storm the area, which they promptly did. Now, think about this. In the Soviet Union, they dropped a nuke, basically just next to their own military units, because they were in the panel legion. Precautions, you ask? What, do you still think that the lives of the citizens had any meaning in the USSR. Penal Legion groups were also used to mine radioactive uranium with nothing but pickaxes, do insanely dangerous repair jobs, and, in case of war, 
they'd be the people who'd clear minefields with their own bodies. I mean, in the World War II, there are some hero stories from the Soviet Union about the guy who just runs on to the Nazi bunker and just jumps on it so that the machine gunner could only shoot him and not the squad. And there were a bunch of such stories. The story about the the guy who just jumps on a bunker, where's the machine gun put in, that's actually nothing. These stories were invented by Russian propaganda so that as, as to promote the self-sacrifice and all this cult thing. There was another one when in the Battle of Stalingrad, apparently some guys who are like Soviet soldiers, they, they get enclosed by some German troops. And as the propaganda portrays it, they know that they're going to die. So they take their hand grenades and they go out and they allow the tank just drive over them and then they explode the grenades and they take a bunch of German tanks with them. None of them survive. Have you noticed the problem yet? None of them survive. So, uh, in the Soviet Union there was this huge cult of people sacrificing themselves for the greater good. Just like Tau in 40k or something. They were mostly invented stories about false heroism, because people really didn't like this, but it was a part of the pathos. And if you go totally alone in the German lines, far away from everyone else, and then you never come back, how even the story got around is the problem here. And everyone in the Soviet Union was just joking, well, yeah, the Soviets think they really died and killed themselves? Hmm. Everyone knows they just ran to the Germans because they wanted some more of the sausage. Really, patriotism wasn't very great back then either, but these exaggerated studies were a huge part of the military morale in the Soviet Union. But just think about this. The Soviets dropped basically a nuke, a small tactical nuke, but they dropped a nuke on their own people. And these people weren't even medically treated afterwards because they had signed a paper saying that you just can't tell anyone where you were serving and what were you doing. And a huge amount of people in early 60s when the Cuban crisis is going on, they're dying by that time from the radiation poisoning. You know, it happens over time, they develop cancer and die. And the doctors from that era, they don't even have really explanation and they just can't tell anyone this. Because although the people weren't shot that much anymore in that time, 60s, 70s, also due to the fact that Khrushchev played up this mass killings of Stalin and the atrocities committed by Stalin as one of his own selling points, how he became the leader and this turning back from Stalin, you could still get to be sent to prison. And if you told someone about what actually happened, your family could get in trouble. So all these mysterious deaths in random parts of the country from the people who served at that time and all these really mutated and mutilated children, which had just happened afterwards, it was all just really killed down uh, by the Soviet Union then. But yeah, that happened to you if you misbehaved. You got to got, got nuke tossed on you, and I don't even know what, what worse could happen. But yeah, on average, average, these people just worked more in the farms and were really physically abused. It wasn't very nice to be in the guba. After all this pleasantness, people in the 70s, well, because the people came back home from the army and, and just went back to their families, were a bit informed about how things worked. So desertion wasn't as common as planned. Now and then, of course, someone on guard would shoot his colleagues and run away, but those things happen rarely, about twice a year in a large army base. But a plan is a plan, like I told you before, and even catching deserters is a plan. So, basically the KGB guys had a certain number of people they had to arrest for desertion in a certain district. They did just that. No more and no less. Not enough people arrested this month? Why, look, there's a soldier on vacation. Have a vacation permit? No, you don't anymore. Off to Guba. And vice versa. They were just doing their, well, quite bloody, but still just doing work, not being monsters. If enough people had been caught, then you could, this actually happened with my dad, be lying dead drunk in full uniform in the middle of the street at night. They'd get you up, call you lucky, and tell you to, you know, just off with you. If their quota was full, then you could just basically do anything. For all of this, this treatment of the officers and this enforced catching of deserters and other people who were just on vacation, disregarding whether or not they actually had done anything. The KGB was hated by the army, and the KGB hated them back for the JRU. You don't even probably know about the JRU, and, well, it just shows how well they did their jobs, really. GRU, or Главное Развязывательное Управление, or in plain English, Main Intelligence Directorate, was what you always thought KGB was. That was the Soviet counterpart of CIA. They were directly subservient to the army, 
and controlled the famous Spetsnaz, by the way, which was a thing the KGB wanted to do. And in the upper echelons of power, there was always a fight between the Politburo army members and the Politburo KGB members about who should control the intelligence of the state and the Spetsnaz. Because, you know, it's a source of power, and the upper echelons of the Soviet Union were always a bit like Game of Thrones. Also, remember the fact that not all the people who were summoned to serve the army could even read, or speak Russian for that matter, which was like the official language of the Soviet Union, as you know. Sometimes the conscription involved going in the mountainous regions or in the steppes with actual nets. Nets. To capture the local male members of pastoral communities to drag them into the army in an attempt to civilize them a bit. It was actually considered for these people, because the Soviet Union was so vast, that they were just living in villages, even in the 60s and the 70s, without any electricity, not knowing how to read. And there are still people in Siberia who are descendants of the people who just separated from the Orthodox Church, the so-called Old Believers, Staroviri. And there was this small village in Siberia, which was found in, like, 1984 or something, where people didn't know anything after the World War II. Russia is so vast that the big cities and the regions around them, yeah, they're civilized and there are things going on there. But Siberia, which is just the middle of it all, and there's literally nothing in it, yeah, I, I think that it's a bit like Amazon jungle. You could still probably find people who would read from the books written in like 17th, 18th century and not know anything about it. So it's not so surprising that there were actually people dra drafted in the army by special organized units who just went really places where someone knew that there would be a village and just tried to take some people in the army so that they could civilize them. This battle against not being able to read or not knowing how to write and all of this, it was a big part of Russian propaganda, but yeah, this happened even in the late 60s and 70s. Apparently, by the way, my stepdad, in his time in the fleet, had to see a bunch of such people. He told me that when ordered to turn the lights out in the barracks building, one of them tried to blow out a light bulb, just like a candle. Now, that might be a bit too much, I think. Although, directly told to me by my stepdad. But it's wildly, wildly documented that, yes, a huge amount of infantrymen learned to read and write and speak Russian while serving in the army. There were these huge governmental programs that was written in Pravda and other newspapers that, yes, we have made progress, we have civilized people. There is a saying about the Soviet army circulating around. The smart one for the artillery, the cutting one in the fleet, the quick one for the air force, the tough one in the tanks, and the rest are infantrymen. And, well, that was basically true. Except that KGB and GRU, of course, always the first pick of the recruits, and the very top always went for those groups. Which, by the way, about this saying, yeah, uh, it was just circulating around as everything in that time. You see, everything was known to everyone, nothing was properly written down, but all of this was somehow circulating through word of mouth. And this is where I'm taking some of these stories, and things which I'm about to tell you, and all these little things going on here. Because the official bureaucracy was very strict, and there were certain things you could put on paper and things you couldn't. So studying the Soviet Union for a proper historian would involve listening to a lot of stories which happened. Like all the circulating around, anecdotal things, they're the only things which actually remain from this. Which is one of the reasons why I'm doing this, because otherwise all of this will be lost. Except about the night's part and the steps, because that is wildly documented. But these other things, such as the saying, it was never really written down. The Soviets weren't much into the bookkeeping of what actually happened. Sure, they kept the tabs on what officially happened, which was very often completely opposite of what happened actually. The common soldier had other problems besides the fact that he could be arrested by his rivals and had to spend three years in virtual prison. He was used as a free workforce to build roads, help kolkhoz when in not some training, and with large-scale exercises of the Soviet army having an official 5% death rate, the training wasn't fun either. He was supposed to do his orders, no matter how retarded or idiotic they were. Yeah, Dan, Dan Carlin here made quite a few errors in the Ostfron series when talking about the Soviets, mostly due to actually taking Soviet sources at face value, as Western researchers always do, for which over here some people tend to criticize them. But he got this one right. If you were told to force that river, force that river you will. Can't swim? <laughs> well, Mother Russia has a lot of people living there. What, for example, Dan forgot, 
was dedovshina or non-regulated related relationships. Dedovshina literally means something of the sort of father thing. Ded is grandfather. Dedovshina is grandparenthood. These non-regulated relationships, I, I, I hope it's that, because I at least I think how that's called in English, because that's not my first language, and again, I apologize for this. But basically, the longer you served, and the closer to demobilization you were, the closer to going home you were, the less you had to actually do. The guys who were serving their final six months, they were called dembilia, slang for soon-to-be-demobilized. Basically, they ruled over the rookies, and made them do all of their chores and hard labor, which the army just had to do. Beatings of those who didn't obey the system were numerous and severe. And what can a rookie do against the trained Soviet soldier? Then, once rookies became Dembele themselves, the system repeated itself. Oh, it was called Godkovshina in the fleet for some reason, I don't know what the, what the, what the name Godk means. And the analog name for Dembele was Gadki. G-O-D-K-I, Gadki. Oh yeah, did I tell you that the favorite hobby of the people was drinking vodka in the army? Yeah, but the Dembele were not always evil. It was more of the mafia relationship going on there. The following event was told to me by my stepfather and happened when he was serving his second year in the Black Sea Fleet. Now, remember about the idiotical orders and the non-regulament relationships? NCOs, non-commissioned officers, love to give such orders to rookies then punish them when they just couldn't do the order. Mostly Cuba for a while or extremely hard work for a month or so. So in the docks, there were those things that the huge ships put their chains around for cleaning and maintenance, that looked like huge concrete mushrooms, called knecht in Russian. One battle cruiser has been docked there, and the local sergeant has decided to mock a rookie. The sergeant apparently gives him a small metal saw, and orders to cut the, the cruiser's chain. Such orders were common there, because just, you know, to make fun of it, because he couldn't do it. While the miserable sod is doing this, contemplating all the stuff he'll be going through, nearby, on a small repair cart, drives a friendly-looking Dimbil. So this Dimbil knows the sergeant, and hates him with passion, because this stuff has been going on for forever. So he asks, was there really such an order to the rookie? The answer is yes. But just to be sure, Dimbil asks one more time. Because, turns out, he has a blowtorch in the cart. And, after learning of the order... He cut the chain for the rookie. Now, just take a second there and Google up battle cruiser anchor chains. Those are mostly custom made for each ship in the USSR. So he cuts the chain, the anchor gets lost, drowned in the harbor, and the ship is unusable for half a year or so while the new anchor is attached. The responsible for the order is in the Soviet army, always the one giving it. So the sergeant ended up in Gub, but they probably died there too while the rookie got a promotion and uh, three weeks of vacation for an excellent performance while completing his order. Such was the Soviet system. You see, uh, I, 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 I hope that someone from the military is listening to this show, because you might have some fun with this, but I don't know how it goes in other countries, but as far as I've learned, there's this discipline issue in all the armies. There has to be discipline. And in other armies, as much as I've read, because I'm no military expert, as much as I've read, it's the work of sergeants and lieutenants at best, mostly sergeants, to like take care of discipline in the army so that everyone behaves. And In the Soviet system, however, it was always the, the responsibility of the person who gave the order and stuff like that. So if a soldier misbehaves in his barracks, he tells it to the sergeant, and the sergeant just yells at him whatever. But if he'll tell that the soldier misbehaved in the barracks to his lieutenant, then the lieutenant will punish the sergeant, and then, if the lieutenant tells it to his colonel, or someone higher up, then the lieutenant will also get punished for not enforcing the discipline. Discipline always went up. There was no limit. If so, if a soldier is, like, doing something terrible, then even the colonels could get punished for that. It was the responsibility of, really, the, the higher ups. So nothing got told up. And by the way, you know who invented this kind of useless system which makes everyone just worry about their backs? Yeah, the famous General Zhukov, who also, at one point while traveling the army, let go, without a pension, about 300 or so officers from the Soviet military. Although in the Soviet era, they really couldn't even get another profession while they were serving. Just to put things in perspective, uh, from 60s to 70s, and I think it even goes up to 80s, there were eight 
tank armies in the world. And when I'm using the word army here, I'm talking about these huge formations of troops. So eight dedicated tank armies in the world, all of them belonging to the Soviet Union. They didn't have much in the way of nuclear weapons in the 60s. That got fixed in the 70s because of the Korolev incident and all the, um, all the fact that they didn't really have good rocket fuel, but eight tank armies. So a bunch of officers were just sent away, which at one point really decapitated the Soviet army again, and soldiers in the Soviet army were not really full with morale. If they got yelled at, had to do all this hard work, and being in the army was a power grab for the people above, but for the people actually serving there, it was mostly pointless. Sure, they had a bunch of tanks, and they just could run over all of Europe, but they just couldn't do that because everyone here was afraid of American nukes. Not to mention the fact that the Americans had way too many nukes to destroy all life on planet Earth. The problem was, during some period of time, the Soviets didn't have accurate rockets, nor their rockets could be launched fast enough, nor they were fueled well enough to actually hit the United States of America. This is the situation. The upper echelons are fighting for political power, the lower ones... Ah, <sighs> about the common soldiers again. Most of the time, the soldiers were just trying to find ways of getting drunk. My dad's oldest brother served in the Far East Siberia, which is tundra and plain nothingness for miles on end. Airplane testing base, by the way, coupled with the radar there. The closest town is about 300 kilometers away, on kilometers and miles thing. I don't know how that translates exactly, because I am not familiar with the Imperial system. Well, except inches, because those are used in 40k. And I am an Imperial Guard player, if someone there cares. I will be using metric system for this podcast. Anyway. They have one car there, for the officers. It breaks down and they have to order reserve parts for it. And no joke, reserve car parts were an extreme deficit. There, were, there just weren't enough of them. Supplies are airdropped there once per month. Well, at one of such months, the supplies didn't contain vodka for some reason. It was a small local tragedy, because the USSR military forces just couldn't function without vodka. Then again, nothing in the USSR could, and they can't exactly fly anywhere, because the higher-ups might see that they're doing just that. And you know what happens then, and with all the discipline problems mentioned previously. But, as we'll, as we'll see next time, a Soviet man is an ingenious man. So the local officer, my dad's brother, and some other guys take one of the planes stationed there and use it to drive 300 kilometers to the closest town and back for vodka. And another one from my collected stories from serving in the Soviet army. Again, from the fleet. If you served there or other such crazy regions, you just had to do two years, not three. So, as we all know, Soviet army doesn't function without vodka. The northern fleet, which basically did nothing but sat on the ice all the time, would have basically died out without it. There were no special relationships there. Everyone on the ship was almost constantly wasted, because almost nobody there loved the regime anyways. Because who got sent to the northern fleet? Exactly. People from Baltics, the people from modern-day Ukraine, modern-day Georgia, and all the southern parts. Basically everyone who wasn't exactly a Russian. And these people didn't enjoy being under the Soviet Union that much. The headquarters knew about this, of course. So they come to inspect one such a ship in the Northern Sea in a small motorboat from the nearest coast. They arrive secretly right next to the ship at 8 a.m. The wake-up call is technically at 6 a.m., by the way. There are no signs of life visible on the ship. Obviously, everyone's sleeping, being drunk, or not giving a damn. So one of the people from the inspection commission uses the side ladder to sneak on the ship, finds a bunch of oily rags, puts them into an empty paint canister. I don't know how precisely those small 10 liter paint or hard cut barrels are called in English. And sets it on fire, while ringing an alarm and hiding away. Now, while the alarm rings, a single boatman comes onto the deck, looks at the burning barrel, and while saying a very loud blood, which literally means whore, but is used exactly how would you use the term fuck while swearing in such a situation in English. And he just kicks this small barrel overboard and into the motorboat where the inspection is sitting. Fire breaks out, huge trouble for everyone, but the end result is a couple of medals for heroism in the rescue operation of the inspection, the next promotion for the ship's captain, together with three weeks of vacation, as was usual, and a bunch of other awards. Now, like I told you before, all of these stories told here are anecdotal ones, but I firmly stand by the position that even if the stuff here was a bit exaggerated as told to me, that it still sounds completely believable and could have happened in the crazy Soviet system. 
the incompetence and the craziness of all of this is is hard to explain because in the official documents, of course, nothing of this existed. No stories, no nothing. But the general life was so misorganized, there was blatant corruption everywhere, and the army was this world of its own that all of this is believable. And for one, there are not just only funny tales, there are truly tragic ones. In my school, I had this teacher who basically taught me Latvian grammar. And he was also a journalist, and he served in the artillery during the Soviet era. And when I talk to you about this 5% death rate in military exercises, yeah, that's that's not a joke, because uh, he got sent to the far Siberia in a military exercise, and it was so cold out there, and they had no warming materials or anything really, and they weren't allowed to make fire, that he and some of his colleagues as he told me personally, had to literally sit by the exhaust pipe of a truck to warm themselves for a while. And they really thought they were going to die there. It was tragic for the basic soldier there. And remember there was this Kursk incident in 2001, I suppose, where the Russian submarine, nuclear submarine, got lost in the Norwegian waters, and there was a leak in the reactor, and trouble happened, and the Russian government refused aid from the Norwegians. Yeah, there were also this, there's this The Hunt for Red October, I, I guess that was the movie called, that, I guess that's how the movie called, uh, it's about this accident in the Soviet submarine, where again, reactor failure, and they had to seek help, that was a real incident there. The Soviet Union really hid everything they could. There was this huge incompetence, and because of this plan they had, as with everything, they really, they they had to hide this from the public and from the allies on the opposite side of the Cold War. They had massive stores of weaponry and of everything. They really didn't care about the lives of people there. They were well-trained and well-equipped, but literally everyone in the Soviet army was depressed about the state of existence in there. And it's hard to imagine today, knowing what we know about the Soviet Union and their military might. But again, and I'm coming back to movies over here uh, again, and I spoke about Rocky IV, I guess, or if I didn't... Oh yeah, I told you about... Uh, <clears throat> it shows that while even Drago is training in these very ultra-modern, extremely scientific circumstances, and the American hero, Rocky, just goes to some wilderness in Russia and trains in these very weird and wild circumstances, like very poor, non-scientific. When that movie appeared in the 90s over here, we just knew it was completely wrong. No American would be allowed to go outside the tourist-designated cities. The way the Rocky trained in Rocky IV was the way that everyone trained, really, here. There wasn't such scientific training, even for our top athletes, and neither for the army. And even Drago is supposed to be from the army, and he doesn't run run off, he isn't drunk, and there isn't incompetence going on there. Now, about all these anecdotal stories, uh, here's one, which you might know, which is wildly documented. It's the 1960s U-2 incident, which blatantly demonstrates the incompetence of the Soviet Union. Now, the U-2 incident of the 1960 was that in the 1st of May in 1960, during the Cold War, a U-2 spy plane was shut down in Soviet Union. It was flown by the CIA pilot, Francis Gary Powers, and it was hit by a surface-to-air missile, and crashed. It was covered up initially, but then Khrushchev exposed this incident, and Powers was sentenced to three years imprisonment, plus seven years of hard labor, and he was then released later during an exchange for the famous spy Rudolf Abel. But the spy stories aside, he was supposed to die there, but what happened there was that U-2 spy plane at the time was a real marvel of engineering and the Russian fighters couldn't fly as high as the U-2 could, so they couldn't shoot it down. But the USSR had, like, excellent missile systems to defend all of this. They had these short-range missiles, which were supposed to be the anti-air defense. And the U-2 just happened to fly over one of these anti-air defense zones. What happened was that there were some new experimental fighter planes, specifically designed to, like, counter the U-2 plane, sent to, to, like, take it down, but they really couldn't reach it, so the U-2 flies in the rocket zone, and rockets are fired towards this U-2. But there are still Soviet fighters in the air, 
and it's the 1st of May, which is a really huge celebration in the Soviet Union, because the 1st of May is the International Workers' Day, which is the, like, biggest party in the Soviet Union. Everyone was partying, it was day off. What happened there is that the first rocket launched actually managed to hit Gary Powers, Francis Gary Powers' uh, U-2 plane. But due to the fact that launch codes had just changed from the 1st of May, but that the 1st of May was a holiday, the command center, which had sent the missiles, was unaware that the plane was destroyed for more than 30 minutes. And there were, like, the U-2 plane flew straight between two areas of missile defense. So, one of the Soviet MiG-19 fighters, two fighter fighters pursuing powers, was actually destroyed by the missile salvo. The MiG's IFF transponders were not yet switched to the new May codes because of the damn holiday. IFF stands for Identification Friend or Foe. That's the code that you input so that the smart rocket doesn't shoot you if it comes close to you, it doesn't explode. IFF can only technically identify friendly ones, not hostile ones. It just reduces friendly fire incidents because the rocket is programmed not to explode or just move its trajectory or something like that. Due to the 1st of May and the fact that Soviet everyone was drinking because this is a holiday when the U-2 was shot, he really hadn't even received uh, the, uh, the new codes for this friend-foe system from his superiors because his superiors were busy going on a hunt and being drunk. So while we took down the U-2 plane and the pilot managed to catapult himself out and survive and there were no American casualties in this, one of our own guys, this Sergei Ivanovich Safronov, he died by friendly fire while the Soviets were really trying to take out a spy plane from the United States. That's competence for you people. Basically, the incident, how he was killed, happened because although the first missile hit the U-2, it exploded in pieces. And those pieces were large, and the large pieces of it looked on the Soviet radar system that it was continuing to fly. So they launched additional missiles after the first one, but at that time, when they were in the same area, the Safronov's plane was there, and as he didn't have his working IFF system, the missile programming thought that he was the U-2 plane and hit it instead, so he posthumously died. And this is a well-documented incident. And this is where I kind of claim some legitimacy for the stories which I told you before. So, what can we learn about all of this? Well, I didn't focus here on the amount of the military forces that the Soviet Union actually had, because it was huge. It wasn't very good, but it was huge. The Spetsnaz was very great. The spying and the intelligence was excellent, but the average soldier was illiterate, very bored, and drunk most of the time. And the incompetence at every level after Stalin's death was making the Soviet military less than interested in doing anything. They basically won by sheer numbers and by not caring enough and just doing their orders. I mean, in Hungary in 1956 or in Czechoslovakia in 1968, where they actually had to use their troops to stamp out some revolutions, which I'll talk about some other time. During those times, they were actually stopped for a while by these rebellers. And a lot of the army and the KGB army was used to basically stop people running away from the Soviet Union because life there wasn't that easy. It was an inner, inner police, basically. And although the army was huge and dangerous by numbers, it wasn't good with morale. It's not very good on offensive wars against enemies who are equally determined. And I might be going a bit political here, but just look at what's going on in eastern Ukraine. The Ukrainians, while having a way smaller military and not enough funding for their military and just a war being in their own country, they are facing off mercenaries, Russian-funded rebels, and some parts of the Russian regular army. Although they're, the Russians are trying to keep it as covert as possible, but they're really holding their own there. And I think that Russians can overwhelm you with sheer numbers, and I think that the Soviets could overwhelm the West with sheer numbers and with their tactical nukes, as they could actually practice launching an assault after a tactical nuke, which they actually did. It wasn't that good or that scary as other people might think. Not that it matters that much when the Russian tanks would come rolling in, but the army was mostly for these police actions in the neighboring states. They had allies, and then they really could take Europe because of the sheer numbers of it and the mechanization of it. 
all the Soviet economy was going apart. I'm sorry, I'm just calling it a Russian, sometimes not Soviet, which would be the more proper term, because that's how we in Latvia felt like it. And even the people in the army felt like it. Because we were under Russians that time. We weren't equal in the Soviet Union. We were under Russian control and in the Russian Empire, so to speak, even more. And that's how it felt. Therefore, I'm making this mistake of just saying Russians when I mean the Soviet Union. And this happens with me right now, 25 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, even though I am just talking about this in a podcast. Now think about it, how was it for Latvians, Lithuanians, Estonians, Georgians, everyone else at the time? We weren't the Soviet Union, we were under Russia. Russia ruled all this. It was made of different parts, yes, but it felt like we were really under something and we weren't enthusiastic. We would gain nothing if Russia would start a nuclear war. We would gain nothing if the Korean War was won by the North Koreans. And when the Vietnam War started, everyone knew that Russia was funneling mo- Again, Russia. What I meant was Soviet Union was funneling money which was made from the profits of our kolkhoz, of our industry. All of that was going to support some guys over there in Vietnam which are doing God knows what and we don't care. But they're taking our stuff and they're sending there to fund these guys and your guys are fighting them and we really don't care. Now, what we were worried about was that you would nuke us. And the upper military echelons were also very worried about that. There wasn't that much with what the Soviets could do if you'd actually nuke them. I am not sure that they can do that much now if you would nuke them. Not that I say that you should, because they could nuke back. And I'm pretty sure there's a lot of money that has went in there. But Russia hasn't, and now I'm speaking about the modern day Russia, they haven't cancelled conscription. Although we are, we have just sold this professional army, and we're trying to make our 2% to the NATO's forces, and we're trying to comply with the NATO's requirement that 2% of budget goes to the military and stuff like that, etc. It's interesting to think that the Russians are huge, they cannot be conquered, but I don't think they are that scary. And it's not because of the vehicles or technology. No, they had this top-notch technology always. The planes were brand new. They always, they were always lagging behind the United States, you know. But they were always top-notch. The best planes the state could afford, best rockets, best everything. And it wasn't good enough, because there was no interest in it. No one wanted a war there. It was a control mechanism, and the army was your way to the politics. And this is the interesting part about the post-World War II Soviet Union. As you can see, going down from this military dictatorship during the Stalin's era, and then transforming into this incompetent bubble of nothingness, of incarnate incompetence, I might even say. Because if you do something against it, and even if you try to reform it to the good side, then you get punished. If you were a reformer in the army, and try to make it better, point at the mistakes of someone, most likely your opera You're just a conscript in this army, and then you point out that, hey, we should do this better, that would improve our morale. You don't get anything. No innovation without the approval of party. There was literally no incentive for anyone to do anything in the Soviet army. It was there, it was a system, and not much happened there. And that is the paradox. It could also win the wars it was fighting. It is a military power today. I mean, the Russia is a huge military power today. But it's not because the soldiers will be fanatical when they are defending their territory, then yes. Or because the commissars are threatening to shoot them in the back, then of course, yes. But attacking someone with zeal and fanaticism? No, they just just wouldn't do that. And that is why when I hear about these extra fears that the Russians are going to nuke someone, as weird as it seems, the United States during the Cold War, as far as I know of, were much closer to actually attacking Soviet territory with nukes than the Russians were. The Soviets were, I'm sorry, again. They were closer to that because the generals advised Harry Truman, for example, to nuke the border towns. Essentially, no one argued in the Soviet Union during that time that we should actively nuke the Americans. That was a silly idea. Nobody wanted a war. Everyone wanted just this status quo. There, some some historians speak about the fact that maybe Stalin lost the World War II because he didn't get what he wanted. If you speak in terms of getting what you want with your military forces, then Stalin definitely didn't do what he wanted to. But the Soviet Union was never nuking the United States because the army was more of a political tool because the Czechoslovakia and Hungary were also just in the Soviet sphere of influence here. 
And that's what's happening in Ukraine. Because one thing that was going for them is that the Russian army is a different beast from, like, civilized armies. Individual heroism is played up, discipline is an issue, everyone is drunk. That's the Soviet way. Everyone is drunk, discipline is bad, and the people are just not very enthusiastic because they are under the oppression of a um, major world power. And let's not forget that there were a lot of Muslims in the army at the time when the religion was forbidden. Well, not exactly forbidden in the 60s. It was forbidden a bit earlier in the 60s, they were a bit lenient about that. But hey, I think you get the point. The army wasn't that grand. It was red. It wasn't that grand. It delves into this territory of Soviet cultural depression and how things were going there. So from my material, I, I guess I'm gonna end this time with this quite sad tale of insane amounts of technology that were just left to rust. All this incompetence of the Soviet armies and all of that that's going on here. I'm going to do a culture show next about this general cultural feel of the post-Stalin Soviet Union. That's going to be the next theme. And if you have any questions or if there are any specifics that you want to know about the Soviet army, because I didn't touch numbers at all in this show. Military methods that held the state together. They had to overplay it at all times. They had to appear very strong. But to the end, do the numbers matter so much if the state of the army is such that it has friendly fire incompetence incidents and that everyone's drunk? Because the drunkenness issue, yeah, it's, it doesn't make a funny story if I just would tell you about that all the times when when my dad or, or my stepdad or, or other people who served in the army just tell me about, yeah, and then we just, there was this thing like military exercise, we skipped the exercise and got drunk with our officer because we really didn't care. There are tons of such stories. I don't think the numbers matter so much in this case as the feel for the army that never really cared. Why? Because there was nothing to fight for. The Soviet man is a pessimistic man, as I said at the very beginning of this show. And for the most part, he has lost everything that he had at that moment. Thank you for listening to The Eastern Border. If you have any comments or specific details you'd like to know, you're welcome to leave it in the comment section on our site, The Eastern Border. LV, and we'll rummage even to the western border to find you an answer. Like this podcast? Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or on our RSS feed. Happiness is mandatory. Good reviews and donations feed the farmers of our kolkhoz in the great motherland. The eastern border salutes you.